you are foreign to our parts, one inch of rain a year more than Brighton. But no beach. And it comes down in a constant drizzle. Uh, now, a lot of you might be thinking, you know, why, why am I involved in uh, the whole Brexit thing? And I've, I've got to say, you know, I actually didn't even vote because I thought, who could be stupid enough to actually vote to make themselves poorer? And, and I say that being one of six kids who grew up in a council estate about a mile away from here uh, in an area called Brooks Bar, which uh, joins gently in between Hume and Moss Side. <laughs> To quote the old John, John Cooper Clark, we had the one thing money couldn't buy, poverty. <laughs> but also, you know, the whole idea, you know, you know, for me, you know, growing up and, and being a lucky kid in that way, to grow up when we joined the EU as well, you know, later on in life, because I remember what life was like before we joined the EU, and living under private landlords before we moved into a council house, overrun with mice, and when I say overrun with mice and how bad the conditions were that we lived with, because there was no ECJ, there was nobody overlooking the conditions that you lived in in those days. I mean, we had a cat, right? By the time we moved out of that house, our cat had the thousand yard stare of a Vietnam vet that had seen too much action. And then with the EU came great things for us, like a fridge, <laughs> a telephone in the house, a certain amount of job protection for me dad. And uh, you know, and the area that I grew up in again, you know, we you know you look at a lot of uh, the, the kind of push for Brexit is an English nationalist thing. I mean I grew up in Brooks Bar, there were no English. You know, my mum and dad were both uh, Irish with Dubliners, so I can still get that passport and for me kids too. Sorry, I, I, I'm not pulling a ladder up behind me, but I'm going. <laughs> and, and, the rea and the reality was, you know, the other kids in our street were Jamaican. So I, don't act I can honestly say I didn't even have a friend who was English till I was 18. And uh, but, I mean, to, to tell you how bad it was, uh, my, my mum was the seventh of eight kids and she moved over to Manchester when she was four. And her youngest brother, the Uncle Bill, was actually born in Manchester and referred to by my granny Bridget ever after as the English bastard. <laughs> and, and ask me then, he was no good really, because uh, he hated the English, so his only expressions of his Irishness was that he drank Guinness, he betted on horses with Irish names, not a good system by the way, <laughs> I would support any team at any sport whatsoever against England. <laughs> so those were circumstances I grew up in, and the idea that, that you're in something like the EU, it, it kind of makes you feel warm and embraced in something cosmopolitan, something real. Because what, what we are destroyed by in this country is the class system. Now later on, you know, Andrew Adonis, he, he is on his way, he's in Oldham. What's, what he's done to, to deserve that? <laughs> <laughs> he was in care as a youngster. He's done nothing as far as I'm concerned to deserve Oldham on a Friday night. <laughs> I hope he's got minders with him. But he is on his way here. And, and the thing is, you know, Andrew O'Donnell wrote, wrote a book back in 1997 about the class system. And that is a big driver for Brexit in this country. And things have become divided across, across class divides, even though class doesn't really come into it, you know, because depending on where those working classes are, they would have voted leave or remain. But there, there was a big case where working class people in Britain felt they'd been left behind. And for whatever reason, they've ended up blaming the EU. And it's to win that argument and convince them, and I think they start to be convinced, I think for, for all the bravado, you put them to a people's vote, which must be inevitable, surely, mm. in a booth on their own, even if they bother to turn up, if they voted leave last time, they will vote remain this time, even if they don't admit it. And it's like, you know, nobody that I grew up with voted leave. None of the people I know. Because although they were working class, they weren't that stupid in a way. You know, they, they weren't kind of self-defeat, because they, they know that it's not the EU that is to blame. But the class system in this country drags us back 
dances behind the rest of Europe to start with. I mean, where else? Imagine if we didn't have a class system. Would anyone invent it? Would anyone say, wouldn't it be a good idea if uh, we had a royal family, no matter how stupid they were, uh, were always kind of going to be looked up to just because they were born there. And, and this is something that they don't have. They don't suffer that in the rest of Europe. We need to catch up with them. We need to give ourselves that permission to be as good as them, to see our wealth shared out. And, and that's why I got on board with, with the whole anti-Brexit movement, because to me, this is the biggest disaster that has been you know, facing us, really, since World War II, and maybe before that. And I say that as somebody who grew up working class. To me, it's really important. So that's why I'm here tonight. I'm only here to chair the discussion. These are the experts. I mean, for me, you know, kind of instinctively, a new leaving the EU is a bad idea. Once we've left the EU, a bit like when somebody diagnosed me a few years ago with a type 2 diabetes, you go online and you look up everything you can about that illness. And that's what Brexit is to me. It's a terminal illness. And we've got to show everybody else this is bad for you. We can't move forward as a country, as a people, unless we scrap it. So anyway, that's enough from me. I'll introduce you to our distinguished panel. I love watching their stuff on YouTube. Just put me off a bit, that is a scouser. <laughs> hey, nobody's perfect. And in fact, I'm old enough to remember when as a Man United fan, we hated Everton more than Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> it's Graham Hughes, three men in a three, three blokes in a pub. Wait, let me choose the resident before you go. <laughs> He's going to do his speech, but he can't wait, can he? Greyhounds in the traps, is that Shakespeare? And then in the middle, we've got uh, Mike Dugan, who's a professor of uh, EU law at the University. One of, one of those experts, you don't need to hear from experts, of course, do it. And uh, on the end there, you've got Madeleine Kay, a warrior for the EU, the EU supergirl, which is going around everywhere. Fighting <laughs> um, the fight, because it is, a, and, and again, you know, fuck Femi Oki as well, you know, I love all his stuff. Because I follow all these people online, they become new heroes to me. Uh, but we're going to start off uh, with hearing from, let's hear from a professor first. Don't worry, he's, from, he's in Liverpool now, not from Liverpool. Uh, from Belfast, in fact, uh, Professor Mike Dugan. Thanks very much, and um, um, thanks very much for the invitation, obviously, to come over, uh, to, come over to Manchester. Um, uh, I've got a bit of a dilemma because when Dominic invited me, he said, maybe you can talk either about the Irish border problem or about uh, general Brexit stuff. Um, and so what I did was I did both. And I thought, well, well I'll let you decide. So um, I've I, I got a quick show of hands. Would you like to hear about a sort of detailed academic discussion of the Irish border problem, which will be very educational, and I'm assuming it will be useful, given that it's the main issue, which is in the news a lot these days, it might be useful for you as campaigners to know a bit more about it, yeah, yeah. or yeah. would you like, as an alternative, my general sort of checklist of why Brexit is such a contemptible disaster <laughs> and a stain on humanity? I'm going to Dublin Politics Festival next weekend, so I quite appreciate to have some background knowledge. For okay, uh, Irish border, okay, well, quick show of hands, Irish border? That's quite a lot. Um, Brexit, general disaster, shite. <laughs> Not quite so much. Irish border wins the day. Okay, um, Irish border talk then. Um, I think that, that first of all, uh, just, just by way of background of course, we need to remember that, that a lot of the attention is focused on the Irish border. The Irish border is only one of the major challenges which is facing Ireland, North and South. Um, everybody, everybody agrees that Northern Ireland, of all the parts of the UK, is going to be most damaged by Brexit, come what may. Everybody deems, uh, agrees that of all of the member states of the EU, the Republic is going to be most damaged by Brexit, potentially even more than the UK itself. Um, it's just a total disaster. 
But it is the, 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 the border question which is um, the most pressing, the most difficult, um, the most difficult to, uh, to solve. Now, of course, the latest fashion in leave propaganda, and it's only the latest fashion, is to deny that the Irish border problem is actually a problem. You probably have seen Sammy Wilson stand up in front of the news cameras and say that this has just been made up by the EU as a way of punishing the UK, that it's made up by Remainers to try and keep the UK tied into the single market, the customs union. Of course, that's absolute rubbish. Everybody who has two brain cells to rub together, therefore excluding <laughs> Sammy Wilson, <laughs> knows, that, knows that this is a serious challenge, a very difficult challenge. Now, it's worth reminding ourselves briefly what, what the nature of the challenge is. Of course, it's an economic challenge. If you're going to erect physical frontiers for customs and regulation between the north and the south, you're effectively destroying agricultural and manufacturing bases in both parts of the island, which are heavily integrated, heavily dependent on supply chains. It's partly about the social disruption. Do you need me to all stand up? But then I won't be able to see my notes because my eyesight's so shy. <laughs> Shall I I'll prop myself up a bit like this? It's very good for my posture anyway. Um, Social disruption. Uh, obviously, if you live in one of the border communities, which is suddenly going to find life much more difficult, um, it's not very desirable. And of course, the sheer logistical fact that you've got over 200 formal crossing points between the north and the south, you physically cannot erect and police and enforce 200 border crossings across such a tiny territory. But most of all, of course, it's the, it's the physical manifestation of the border, which is a potential political significance and catastrophe in Northern Ireland. Um, I obviously come from Belfast, so I know the place very well indeed. Um, and part of the genius of the Good Friday Agreement, and it is a genius agreement, is that it manages to convince both unionists and nationalists that they've won. And in, in Northern Irish politics, it's all about making people think that they've won. Mm. The unionists have won because for a very long time, the foreseeable future, Northern Ireland will remain part of the UK, and yet pretty much everyone accepts that. But for nationalists, they've won, because it doesn't really matter that much. The only thing you notice as you travel across the island of Ireland is that the signs change from miles to kilometers. And apart from that, you can basically pretend that you're part of a united Ireland if you really want to. Now, the absence of the physical frontier, then, is, is desperately important for economic, social, logistical, and political reasons. Now, it's not helped, obviously, that Northern Ireland and its politicians are incapable of forming a meaningful um, administration to, to run the territory. Um, and, and Brexit was only ever going to make this worse. Regardless of the border question, Brexit was only going to make it worse. But of course, the border is simply pouring oil onto a fire. Now, it, we have to be honest with ourselves and, and realize that, of course, these concerns, while they may appear obvious to me, to you, to most of the people in this room, they are not universally shared across this country. You may have seen the research that was published in Edinburgh a couple of weeks ago that suggested that well over, well over 80% of English League voters believe that a collapse of the peace process in Northern Ireland is a price worth paying for their beloved Brexit. That is an utterly shocking statistic. The idea that well over 80% of English League voters, that's about 15 million people, believe that civil war in Northern Ireland would be worth it in order to deliver Brexit is a shocking statistic. So these are not universally shared concerns. Um, nevertheless, what was always going to be a difficult position has, of course, been made far, far worse by the stupidity of the Theresa May government in simply promising totally undeliverable things to different groups of people. We're going to leave the single market and the, and the customs union, therefore we're going to have a, a border between the UK and the EU. Everyone knows that. But we're not going to have a hard border in Ireland. We're going to ensure that there's no return to the border in Ireland. OK, how do you do that? That means that Northern Ireland has to remain within the customs union and the single market, even if the rest of the UK leaves. But we're not going to do that, because we're not going to treat Northern Ireland differently from the rest of the UK. How do you do that? By the whole of the UK staying in the customs union and the single market. <laughs> Just back to the start of the circle again. The government's position is completely inane, totally incompatible, thoroughly incompetent, and or dishonest, probably both. But, uh, that's the nature of 
structure of the problem. Now, when I say the problem, of course, I mean that's the nature of one of the 20,000 problems <laughs> that we have to deal with, but it's the problem that I'm talking about right now. What about the solution? Well, here I'm assuming that most people in the room know about the joint report, the joint report of 2017, all of these obscure legal documents that suddenly get thrust in the, into the limelight. And you probably know, of course, that the UK government is pinning the hook, its hopes on the idea of solving the Northern Irish border problem simply as part of the overall future relationship between the UK and the EU. Um, the problem is, of course, that the UK government is completely incapable of coming up with any credible proposals for what that overall future UK-EU relationship might look like. The Checkers plan, if any of you are particularly interested, I did a little video on it um, in Liverpool a few weeks ago to point out just how rubbish it really is. But, 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 but everybody knows that it's unworkable, let alone unacceptable to a large part of the, of the UK Parliament. But it's, it's simply unworkable, it's not deliverable. Now, whatever the UK government hopes, I'm sure we all know that they've committed to the backstop, a legally binding backstop, that regardless of what else happens, regardless of what might come, there will be no hard border in Northern Ireland. And of course, that this is a genuine possibility. The backstop, Theresa May loves to pretend that it's just some theoretical thing that might, that will never be used, it will never come into play. That's absolute rubbish. On any realistic assessment of the UK situation, the backstop is the most likely outcome of what will have to happen at the end of this transition period that she's negotiating. So this isn't a purely theoretical thing. It is almost certainly um, got to be designed to be workable and deliverable because there's a significant chance that it might actually need to be used. Now, as we probably all know, the EU's proposals for the backstop is that basically Northern Ireland should remain within the customs union and significant parts of the single market. And that does mean, of course, that there will have to be new checks between goods travelling between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. <coughs> uh, we all know that the UK government is totally opposed to this. It says that it's completely unacceptable. Um, and, and, and it talks in these increasingly apocalyptic terms as if the entire UK as a state is about to spontaneously <coughs> combust if the EU decides to check the quality of horse semen on a ferry in Scotland <laughs> and, 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 and Belfast. Um, that is the nature of border checks, by the way. Let's not, let's not you have to get your hands dirty. That's the wrong um, phrase, I said. That's <laughs> I said. Um, now, the UK government's only opposition, the only argument that it can come up with is Northern Ireland cannot be treated differently from the rest of the UK. Now, of course, across the whole of Europe, they raise an eyebrow and say, but surely Northern Ireland is already very different from the rest of the UK. You have different rules on abortion, you have different rules on marriage equality, you keep talking about letting them have completely different taxation systems so as to uh, compete with the Republic. Of course, Northern Ireland is treated completely differently from the rest of the UK. But nevertheless, that is the, the, the UK government's position. Now, right, let's finish then with the most recent developments, what has actually happened over the past couple of weeks. Well, on the one hand, the EU has basically said, we are prepared to soften the visibility, soften the visibility and the impact of new checks between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. So, so we, well, they have to be there, we still have to check things, we still have to levy our tariffs, but we'll make it as unobtrusive and un unvisible as possible. The UK government, uh, for its part, has still failed to, failed to publish any more detailed or more credible plans for the backstop itself. But what it has suggested is that, first of all, the backstop shouldn't be just about Northern Ireland, the backstop should cover the whole of the UK. So this is no longer about solving the Irish border problem as a problem, it's about the whole of the UK being tied into the customs market, and, uh, the customs union and the single market. But that can't be an indefinite situation, the UK must be able to terminate it, the UK must be able to stop the backstop. Now, there are various problems with the UK government's approach, and this is probably uh, the bit which is most important for you as campaigners, so as when people ask, you know what these problems are. The first problem, of course, is there just isn't enough time to do this. The EU has basically said it has taken you nearly two bloody years to get to this point, and you're still totally hopeless. What makes you think we're going to agree such a complicated and controversial thing in the space of two weeks? It's just not credible. So we can talk about a UK-wide backstop, but we still need to have the Northern Irish specific one because there simply isn't time to do anything else. The second problem, of course, is that the oh, UK... Hang on, hang on. Yeah. save it, because uh, yeah, well, uh, 
Listen, uh, Professor Michael, we'll, we'll hear more from him, uh, but Andrew Adonis has managed to make it out of Oldham alive. <laughs> so I round of applause for that. Every time I go there, I think they're going to build a wicker man. <laughs> but, uh, but he's only got 20 minutes and he's, he's got to go. Uh, I love his books. He's got a new book out as well at the moment. Uh, please welcome uh, Lord Andrew Adonis. He was no doubt going on to explain what Canada plus 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 was as well. So you've got to understand, the, there's loads of, of garbage that Theresa May is about to bring back from Brussels for the, uh, to replace membership of the European Union. It's going to be Canada plus 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 with the backstop, with the backstop to the backstop, which Michael was coming on to, which is a very, very important part of it, which might be time limited, and which if you read the front page of the Times today, the Prime Minister said that the government might not invoke anyway as a way of appeasing the DUP. So it's an, an inoperable backstop to a backstop, which is also time limited. <laughs> Do you know what I think is the right thing? Why don't we just stay in the European Union? <laughs> and not, and not go anywhere. Now, can I also say, respect to Joe Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, uh, some of us can see what the next Conservative leadership election is going to be. It puts the Miliband brothers to shame. What's going to happen next time? <laughs> That's all. Well, I mean, yeah, we know it, we, which, jo which Johnson we want. But why has Joe done it? Joe, I know Joe, because we're both former Financial Times journalists. We're both people in this very unfashionable these days. There are these things called facts. There's this thing, you know, we, the thing, the things we used, to, we used to guide public policy when we did it. There's this thing called the national economic interest. Do you remember that? There was this time when trade was a good idea, when we liked jobs. Do you remember that age? Where we thought that actually having some income to pay people was a good thing. When the job of government was to make the country better off, not to trash the country. Do you remember those halcyon days when those things happened? <laughs> well, Joe, let's give him his due. He stands for all those things. He's a Financial Times journalist. He was a former uh, Japan editor of the FD. He un really does understand this business about international trade and all that. He's also got uh, the, the job which I had. He's Minister of State for Transport. Now, let's be clear. There are some things which are more important than Brexit. Much more. Uh, managing the trains is, is much more. Uh, once we've stopped Brexit, what am I going to get? I'm going to become the, what they dubbed me last time when I was Secretary of Transport, the thin controller again. You're going to get the Northern House, you're having HS2, you're having East West Rail, all that, and I'm nabbing Joe Johnson's job. But at the moment, what's the most important thing to do? It's to keep it simple. And what is the simple thing to do? People's vote, option to stop Brexit, campaign like that, no Brexit, end this nightmare. That is And, by the way, there are a few things we're going to do in the process. The BBC is going to become the BBC again. Not the Brexit <laughs> Corporation. We are going to stop welcoming migrants into this country again and end the xenophobia. <laughs> We're going to respect Ireland and not trash Ireland, which is what's going on at the moment. Remember, remember do you know, I think some of the most monstrous things that are happening at the moment is British policy in respect of Ireland, as Jacob rees mogg tries to turn the clock back to somewhere in the Middle Ages, in terms of our relation with Ireland. Because remember what Jacob says is the answer. By the way, what I always ask the Brexiters now is, what is their answer to the Irish problem? Because... Um, what Michael was busy explaining to you is this big problem. You cannot have different customs and tariff arrangements and a different immigration policy, which is what the Brexiters are proposing, and not have a hard border. You have to have a hard border. You may be able to do it without having the actual physical infrastructure there and pretend it's not there and do it by having mobile searches and 
checks and stopping vehicles and all that, but you have to have hardware. And of course, this is hugely toxic in Northern Ireland and could bring back the troubles, let's be clear, because it would lead to smuggling. Smuggling will be in the hands of the paramilitaries, which is why the Chief Counselor of the Peace Service of Northern Ireland has said that the biggest threat facing Northern Ireland at the moment is, Bre is Brexit, which is the reason why the Prime Minister is having to negotiate the backstop to the backstop and all that to try and deal with it. But so what I do when I'm with Brexiters, and by the way, I spent longer with Jacob and Nigel and, and Boris Johnson in, t in TV and radio debates on the members of my own family, and you can guess how much I enjoy doing that. <laughs> That's a big thing. But the question I've now started asking, there are two questions, I'll tell you what they are. The first question, actually there are three, let me give you all three. The first question I ask them is, what is your answer to the Irish problem? Because I've got an answer, and you've got an answer, no Brexit. That's the answer. How do you see there's no hard border? No Brexit. It's very simple. It's not complicated. Then you don't have different customs regimes. You don't have different tariff regimes. You don't have a different immigration policy. You don't have to have uh, all the, the infrastructure board you can carry on. Now, do you know what Jacob said was the answer? Jacob's answer to the Irish border question is, Ireland should also leave the European Union. <laughs> now, you've got to give it to him. This is coherent. <laughs> I mean, if they leave the European Union and they adopt our commercial policy and all of that, then you don't need to have a border. There is a slight problem. They don't want to leave the European Union. <laughs> and why should we think that the answer to the Irish problem is neo-colonialism? That, by the way, has got a bit of a history between England and Ireland. It wasn't great last time, and we shouldn't be returning there again. The second question I asked them, by the way, is how much do you think we should pay the EU in the exit deal? Because Theresa May member has said 50 billion. That is the deal which provisionally she's already agreed. Now this 50 billion is hugely important because this 50 billion gives the complete lie to the 350 million a week the NHS on the side of that bus. Do you remember the bus? Hey. Did, did the bus make it to Manchester or did you manage to keep it out? But that was the fun, that was the lie. Actually, there were two lies at the heart of Brexit. One lie was 350 million a week for the NHS. The other lie was the 7 million Turks. Do you remember the 7 million Turks were waiting to invade? You know, they were poised. The Daily Mail said they were coming the morning after the referendum. Uh, they haven't appeared yet, as it happens. We're still in the European Union now. There's still no uh, oh, 7 million Turks. So there's these fundamental lies at the heart of it. However, the other question I asked the Brexiters is how much, if it's not Theresa May's 50 billion, how much are you going to pay? Now this is a good, and this goes to the heart of Brexit, because if they say it's nothing, then of course Brexit is impossible, because we're in default of our international treaty uh, obligations, uh, we, we don't have enough money to pay for all the, uh, the farmers and what they're owed, all the infrastructure projects, the regional development projects on the road, and the whole thing becomes literally completely dysfunctional. But they don't want to admit they're going to pay anything because that then gives the lie to the £350 million. Pounds. And it means, of course, there has to be an agreement with the EU because if you're going to pay money, there has to be an agreement. So I keep asking them, how much will you pay? Nigel gets very irritated with me now. And so after the, fifth, uh, the 15th time I've asked what he said to me, is it should be very little. And I said, well, Nigel, how little? £10 million? £20 billion? I mean, you know, you want it to be less than £50 billion. And he said, you know, Andrew, I think it should be a nice round number, zero. I said to him, Nigel, it cannot be zero. It's got to be a real figure because we have this issue of your pension. <laughs> Remember, Nigel's pension. So he's, been, he's, been, he's, a, he's a Eurocrat. He's been in the European Parliament. He doesn't turn up very often. And he he doesn't get performance, but if he did, maybe he wouldn't get a pension. But he is entitled to the £73,000 a year. And I said, Nigel, it's very important we pay your pension because I do not want you to be, in your old age, a burden on the state. <laughs> Very important that you're not. And I said there's another problem too, because the, uh, my other debate with him is why was he spies in the German embassy you're filling out these big citizenship application forms? Because you know, I have spies everywhere. Madeleine and all these, they, they, they feed back to me. So he was seen in the German embassy filling out the forms. So for several encounters, I kept asking whether it was true that he'd applied for German citizenship for himself, because he has a German, German wife. And I said, I would exchange my seat in the House of Lords for his German passport. It's a fair deal. <laughs> anyway, he got very irritated. He would duck the questions, I knew there was something in it. And he told me in great exasperation afterwards that he was applying for citizenship for his kids. Now, this is very important. I said, this is wonderful. 
and I was just wonderful, you're applying for your children. I said, but there are many millions of other people in their 20s that also like German passports. Why? Because they do not want their citizenship rights taken away from them. And if it's good enough for your children, it's good enough for all of the other young people in the country too. <laughs> So, so I said to him, we have two big problems here. We've got to have an exit deal because we've at least got to pay £73,000 times as many years as you intend to live after the age of 65. He wants to come to the House of Lords, by the way, and that significantly extends your life expectancy. So he could be with us another 40 or 50 years. So it's quite a large exit deal that we need. The other issue we have is this issue of citizenship, which is vitally important. Now, um, Madeleine and a lot of young people, and it's they have most at stake in Brexit, which is the reason why the young are overwhelmingly in favour of staying in the European Union. By the way, we should have votes for 16 and 17 year olds if we have our people there next year. It's their future is more at stake than anything. Vitally important. After he sold me, he had applied for the Joint Hospital. There's this group, your organisation, which some of you may be, belong to, called Our Future, Our Choice which is the young, mobilised and young, which is fantastic. Now, one of these guys is really good at stunts. And the following morning, he turned up at Nigel's house with adoption papers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what wants to be adopted by Nigel. And it, 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 after why, if this, this is one way we have to be known. Needs must. We have a desperate situation. Remedies are needed. One way through this, this quagmire of citizenship might be if Nigel adopts everybody in their 20s <laughs> in the so they can all get German passports. Well, actually, Nigel doesn't, doesn't like this idea at all. He became very angry with me in our last exchange. But I, I've now got a new gloss on this one, which I last time. I said, Nigel, I said, I know that you be, you're not keen to adopt many people in your friends, but I do need to have the answer to a question. What is the maximum age at which you will adopt people? I suppose there are lots of people who are much older. I have a 93-year-old who's very keen to be adopted by you because she also wants a German passport. Will you adopt her? Uh, uh, this is where our banter has got to uh, at the moment. But the crucial point underlying this, of course, is that citizenship rights are being taken away from people. And these citizenship, citizenship rights fundamentally affect people's right to work, to live, to travel, to forge relationships, to do all of those things which we've taken for granted and are one of the best things that's happened in Europe in the last 70 years. So what, are we, what do we want? We want a people's vote, option to remain, defend our citizenship, and just one thing I want to say, because we didn't hear enough about this two years ago in the referendum too, which is also a fundamental reason why we want to stay in the European Union. And do you know what it is? Peace. Yay! Yeah. Um, the reason so many of us are wearing poppies is because, of course, we're celebrating the desperate centenary of the end of the First World War. Two world wars in the 20th century, and the European Union was created in the wake of the second so that it would never happen again. And do you know something? It has been phenomenally successful. There are only 70 years in the entire history of Europe when the peoples of Europe have been very largely at peace. And those 70 years are the 70 years where we were constructing and in the European Union. And why is that the case? Because the European Union is a club of democracies. There's never been 70 years when the major states of, the Euro of Europe have been democracies. And one of the conditions of them coming into the European Union is that they must be democracies and they must respect the boundaries of other European states. Now, at the moment in Europe, we have Putin, who has invaded one European state and half occupied it. Why? Because the Ukraine was about to join NATO and the European Union. He has troops massed on the borders of the Baltic states, with a real and present danger there. We have Mr. Salvini, who is the strong man in Italy, who has taken to tweeting Mussolini slogans on Mussolini's birthday this year. So you can see where that's going. You've got Orban in Hungary, who has abolished what goes for a free press, suspended judges, and is trying to abolish a university run by a Jew. You can see where that is going. 
The official opposition in Germany at the moment is the AFD, which has strong neo-Nazi elements in it, and the runner-up in the French presidential election two years ago was the National Front. Oh, and by the way, just the elections in Sweden, where the far-right party got 18%. Now, exam question. In this period of great instability with the rise of the far right, should Britain A, stay in the European Union and be at the heart of Europe, or B, leave Europe, become semi-detached, and complain when Europe falls prey to far right forces and the threat of massive instability caused by Russia? The fundamental point about this is that it's not just a nice to have Europe, it's not a nice to have alone, though it is nice to have more prosperity rather than less prosperity, trade that's free and all of that. It fundamentally defends our peace and our freedom. And if we take that for granted, which is what's now happening in this Brexit business, we will pay a very, very heavy price. And this week, the centenary of the end of the First World War, we should be very, very conscious of the price people have paid in the past and not subject the next generation to the possibility of having to pay a high price because we have played fast and loose with the peace and security of Europe. And this goes back to the very beginning of the European Union, because where does the European Union come from? It comes from the end of the Second World War, Winston Churchill's Zurich speech of 1946, where in the wake of the Berlin blockade and the Iron Curtain, he called for, and these were his words, a kind of United States of Europe, which is what led to the European coal and steel community being founded, and then the Treaty of Rome, the common market, the European Union as we have it now. And do you know something, because you haven't read this much in the Daily Mail and the Sun over the last 30 years, but the European Union has been a phenomenal success. It has been the best project for international peace, harmony and prosperity, probably in the history of civilization. We should be proud, we remember, we should be at the heart of it, we should have a people's vote, we should win the people's vote, and we should put this nightmare behind us. Thank you. Say much longer, but when everybody has got any questions for him, I mean, obviously, I read his book on class years ago. You know, and it, it, you know, it, oh, what about Corbyn saying to Judas Spiegel, Brexit can't be stopped? I've never been so proud. Yeah, I, I, I mean, again, I'm on the left of the Labour Party, you know, and to me, Corbyn is in hell. I'm sorry. When I get people calling me a player, I, I can't abide it because I go, come, come, grow up where I grew up, then call me a player. But, but the reality is, what's happened to Labour? Why, why are they not opposing this? The overwhelming majority of Labour Party members, there'll be many here this evening, Labour Party members and Labour MPs are against Brexit and for people's votes. And the party's policy, agreed by our conference in, in um, Liverpool uh, six weeks ago, is also in favour of what the six tests, which include the exact same benefits of the single market and the customs union, which means voting against Theresa May's deal, and then we've said that we want an election, but if we don't get an election, then all options should be on the table, including a people's vote. So my own view is that by a process of elimination, we will get to a people's vote. That's what my own view of what will happen. However, it would be a good idea if Jeremy said it up front, rather than being forced into it by the collapse of Theresa May. So what I suggest we do, because we know it's people power here, is people should let Jeremy know what they think about his comments in Dutch people. And you should let him know very bluntly <coughs> what you think on social media, by writing to him, by lobbying Labour MPs, so that we make absolutely sure that Labour does not commit a historic error, historic error, of allowing the far right, Nigel Farage, in league with the right wing of the Conservative Party, forcing a Brexit on us, which will destroy the prospects of working people across the United Kingdom. It does seem like the right wing rats are out the cage, you and then you quickly, yeah. Hello, uh, can I just address this question to Rory Jones? You've spoken a lot about Sardinia and the resurgence of the right and throughout Europe. Uh, one of the uh, comments that I've heard recently about <coughs> Brexit is, is that if we don't give effect to the um, uh, referendum of 2016, 
that that in itself will give to a resurgence of the right in the UK. So how do we respond to that argument? Uh, it's, 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 look, let's be clear. As Churchill said in democracy, the situation we're in with a people's vote is the worst option except the alternatives. Because let's be clear what the alternatives are. The alternatives are to say that we're giving a veto to the far right when it comes to calling another referendum and allowing the people to express their considered view because they say that there will be serious instability if we hold a referendum. And do you know something? I'm not giving a veto in our democracy to Jacob Rees-Mogg, Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson. Any of you think that's a good idea? No. So the lesser evil is to hold a referendum. However, on the question about is it democratic or not, well, remember it was David Davis who told us a democracy which cannot change its mind is not a democracy. It's two and a half years now since the referendum in 2016. That is a longer interval than between the last two general elections. Oh, yeah. And do you know who called the last general election early when she didn't need to? Because she wanted a further expression of the people's will, one, Theresa May. So she can't have her cake and eat it in that respect either. But there's a fundamental reason why it's democratic too, which is, was brought home to me in Belfast, where I've just been. In however bad we think Brexit is here, it's a, it's a hell of a lot worse, potentially, in Ireland because of this border issue, which is really, really worrying them, which is the reason why the latest polls are showing about 80% of them favour of staying in the EU. And uh, they want to defend the Good Friday Agreement, which is the peace, essentially the peace treaty, which would maintain the peace of Ireland. No hard border, power sharing between the nationalist and unionist communities, and very, very close working between the British and Irish governments, which I should say, by the way, is in jeopardy at the moment because of Brexit, which is pulling Britain and Ireland apart. Now, one of the people in the audience in Belfast said to me, when we had the Good Friday Agreement 20 years ago, and there was a referendum, a copy of the Good Friday Agreement, which is a long document, it's a 30-page, very technical document about the terms of decommissioning of weapons and things of this kind, was sent to every voter in Northern Ireland. Why? Because this was going to fundamentally affect their future, and their opinion was being sought in the referendum, and they read it. I mean, loads of people I've spoken to told me about, uh, about it, and, and, read it. And, and, this, and this person said to me, when Theresa May signs her deal, Surely what we should do is send a copy to every voter across the United Kingdom and let them express their view on it in a referendum, as we did here in Northern Ireland. Yeah. I agree with that. I mean, the option, the only credible option facing the country should be between that deal or staying in the EU. We know what staying in the EU is because we're in it at the moment. Now, this is, gives you the complete answer to the reason why we need a referendum. Two years ago, you could not send that document to the British people because it didn't exist. There was no set of terms for what Brexit should be. There was no answer to what's going to happen to the Irish border, our payments to the EU, the rights of EU residents in Britain and British residents on the European continent, what was going to happen to the customs union, the single market, free movement of people, all these crucial issues. There was no policy because it hadn't been negotiated. The first time the British people will know where that policy is, is in a month or two months' time when Theresa May negotiates the treaty. So what should happen is very simple. A copy should be sent to every voter, and that is the reason why we need a people's vote. It's the first time people would have seen it. We're a democracy. This is the biggest issue that's going to affect the British people in our generation. They should get a copy. They're perfectly capable of reading it and making sense of it, and then they should give their view in a people's vote. There's not really time uh, for any more questions for Andrew, but we've got to say, Andrew, and I love your books as well, the platform's fantastic, because, uh, you know, it's fantastic. and the BBC stuff, worked for them for years, couldn't, couldn't believe it when I was listening to uh, the Today programme the other day, when they were trying to balance the IFS and their findings on Brexit with somebody from the Taxpayers' Alliance. <laughs> and just like, the IFS don't represent anyone, they're number crunchers. You know, you don't say your numbers are wrong. So, Andrew, thank you very much uh, for coming uh, today. And, uh, you know, keep, keep up the fight. We can definitely win this. The only thing that's stopping us winning it is a lack of confidence in ourselves in our capacity to win it. 
700,000 people on the streets of London three weeks ago. Every constituency with a big, big pro-European movement which has taken root. With brilliant campaigners like your speakers this evening who, who, who are out there too. Joe Johnson's resignation today is very, very significant because what's essentially happening is that the government is starting to implode. And sensible, sensible, level-headed Tories know that this is the wrong thing to do and this is history type stuff. If we keep pushing now, I am convinced we can win it. We're in the end game, we're in those you know, final 100 yards, we should really, really go for it. That means writing to your MP, doing social media, getting out in demonstrations, and, con and seeking to persuade and work with all your, all your friends too. If we do all those things, I'm convinced we can win it. And that is then only the beginning. Because part of the reason we're in this mess, let's be clear, is because governments didn't do enough to sort out the problems we've got at home, particularly in the Midlands and the north of this country. There is too much poverty, too much division, too much inequality, too much austerity. We need to tackle all of those issues with a new passion, but we will not be able to tackle any of them if we're having an existential argument about our place in the world, our basic security alliances, and the rules of our trade. So what should our message be? Remain plus. Remain but not as an end in itself, but as the basis for doing what should have been done in this country over the last generation, which is really sorting out our social crisis, a fair and much better deal for working people in this country, and then we look back on this period as a nightmare, a car crash avoided, and the basis which we started really sorting out the big fundamental problems which British people are expecting to be sorted out, and it's part of the reason why they voted as they did two years ago. So we can do it, we've just got to have real passion, real commitment, and just absolutely go for it. Thanks very much. Street soon with our bollocks to Brexit bus. Hey. Hey. Anyone got money for crowdfunding for that? Thank you. It's going to be massive, and it's a bit of a controversial slogan. Um, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure why, because it's been proven in a court of law not to be an obscenity, but people are apparently taking offence to it. I mean, personally, I find the word Brexit a lot more offensive than the word bollocks. <laughs> Um, so if you've got any of those stickers yet, make sure you get some from the EU flag mafia store and just stick it everywhere that you possibly can. Um, yeah, so uh, I've been, I hadn't really prepared a speech, I was going to try like Nick Michael's other one, if you've got one. <laughs> um, what, I, what I normally talk about, um, and one of the reasons why I was awarded Young European of the Year this year is um, is about the pro-EU narrative in my campaign because there's a lot of people quite rightly going around up in arms about Brexit, explaining to everyone why Brexit's going to be so bad, all the negative impacts on the economy and our society and our culture, which is a, a very important thing that we need to do. But we have to also remember that in the referendum campaign, Project Fear lost because it failed to engage people. They weren't interested in the facts. And I'm sorry, but the people that weren't interested in the facts at the time probably aren't going to be interested in the facts the next time round either. They're just not interested, they're not engaged. And we've got to get their attention somehow. And we've got to make them care about Europe. And we've got to make them feel part of the big European family. And we've got to make them realise the value of their European citizenship. And that's something that a lot of people don't talk about. Uh, they don't know about the benefits that the EU brings to their lives. And there's two main reasons for that, as far as I can see. It's firstly due to a lack of education in our schools. And that's an education not, uh, about UK politics as well as EU politics. And it's also to do with the media. Because the British people have been drip-fed this Eurosceptic narrative for, for 
four decades in the right wing dominated press and there's been nothing in our left wing liberal press to countenance it, to celebrate the EU and what it's doing to benefit our lives. Um, and that has to stop now. And um, whilst we're campaigning for a people's vote uh, uh, to, to put this Brexit nonsense to bed, we have to begin this pro-EU, this positive narrative Europe about Europe at the same time. And I um, am very in, um, invested in the grassroots communities big, uh, who are campaigning to remain in Europe because we are so pro-EU. We've got EU flags all up around this room. We wave the EU flag with pride. And I am very concerned that some of the official campaigning organisations do not use the EU flag in the way that it should. They don't celebrate Europe as we should. And um, if we do stop Brexit, um, that's a sticking plaster on this problem of um, creating a positive culture about Europe in the UK. Um, so I was, I don't know if some of you have come across my reasons to remain booklets. There should be some on the table, there's loads of posters. Our grassroots communities crowdfunded over £5,000 to print these and distribute them to the local groups to give out at the street stalls. That was a huge community effort and it's about just informing people very simply about what the EU is doing to benefit their lives. Um, and then I think we can uh, start to engage more positively with our European friends and partners too. I was in Poland on uh, Wednesday for an event that was being run by the Schumann Foundation. Uh, they'd done possibly the best analysis that I have seen of the Remain and uh, Leave campaigns during the referendum. Uh, this, this Polish organisation is better than anything that I've seen done in the UK. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to assess the campaigns to see what they could learn, what Polish NGOs could learn from those campaigns in their fight against Euroscepticism and populism. And from my perspective, if there is any Brexit dividend, well, there's two, two possible Brexit dividends I've identified. The first one is this amazing pro-EU community that has come out in the UK to fight it, and you are all part of that community, so thank you for being here tonight. And the second benefit is that the rest of Europe are now looking at us as the laughing stock of the world and, and learning from our mistakes and this is curbing the rise in populism across Europe. Those are the two Brexit dividends um, and those are the reasons why we have to keep fighting Brexit right to the very bitter end. Um, and um, just on a final point on the, on the issue of it being undemocratic, the song that I sang earlier, Vote Leave Broke the Law, Brexit is not democratic. It is not the will of the people. The people were manipulated by illegally funded propaganda. And um, if we want to restore democracy in the UK, we have to de demand a people's vote on the facts um, where both campaigns abide by the law. answer was always the EU, you know, the, the kind of getting rid of those boundaries, you know, where we're all people, we're all citizens, we're all, you know, of the EU, rather than subjects of some nefarious idea of being British. Uh, so, Michael, carry on. Super, super, thank you. Um, I'll finish very quickly on the Irish question, partly because I think it would be more useful to, to highlight a couple of points from what um, Lord Thompson and Matty said. Um, the basic situation is with the Irish question, no matter what the UK government tries to call us with, it is a bloody mess with no solution other than by telling one constituency or another of the people that they'd like to, we're very sorry, but we'd like to you. 
And I suspect that Theresa May's main calculation is, which of the constituencies of people can we afford to alienate and still get our bloody Brexit deal through Parliament? And that's the only thing I think is going through her mind. Will we alienate the DUP and survive with the votes of Frank Field and Kate Coey and all of the other um, horrible local people like that? Or will we alienate the Brexiteers and hope that enough Labour MPs come with us? There is no solution to the Irish problem which does not involve disappointing a significant constituency of interest or simply prompting the collapse of the peace process in Northern Ireland. Um, just a couple of things on, on, on what Lord Adonna said, and I'll, I'll just be really, really brief. Um, first of all, and again, this is more about sort of tactics and what we have to look out for over the, the, the next coming crucial few weeks, and they are crucial. Brexit is such a horror show, and it is a horror show in every conceivable way, in every conceivable direction, that we already know what Theresa May's line is going to be. Anything which is not a complete catastrophe is some sort of triumph or success for the government. And we've got to make sure that people are fully aware that when you compare it to what we've got now, when you compare it to what they were bloody promised by the Leave campaign, and when you compare it to what Theresa May is actually going to achieve, this is not a triumph, it's nothing but a national humiliation and a total disaster. And I think that's a really important message that we've got to get across. Now, just to pick up on what Lord Adonis said, of course, it is, it's very tempting to say everyone should see a copy of Theresa May's deal. I'll tell you what Theresa May's deal is going to be. It's going to be two to three hundred pages of dense legal text about the most boring issues imaginable. What do we do with goods which are currently sitting in lorries at a, at a ferry port at the moment of exit? whose customs rules will apply to them. There's loads of stuff about citizens' rights. By the way, it's Trump and it is a triumph. It's actually a scandal, but uh, I can answer questions about that if you want. What are we not going to see? We're not going to see any credible vision for what the future relationship of this country is going to be between the UK and the EU. That's what we were promised over and over again. We are not going to see it because she hasn't managed to secure it, and that's, of course, what we are all most interested in. So we can read these 300 pages of text about what to do with lorries and customs if we want to, but the crucial things are actually going to be absent. Second point about what to, what to, what to campaign on, what to, what to say. Uh, it is very tempting to always focus, I suppose, on the loss of our citizenship rights, our right to move and travel and retire and work and study across the EU. One of my experiences is that actually, for lots of people in this country, those are very middle-class, aspirational rights which don't connect to their daily lives. And sometimes they actually respond in a negative way to the loss of these citizenship rights because they think that these are things which are beyond their, their reach, their grasp. There's another very important thing that we have to remind people about what the loss of their citizenship rights is. It means no more minimum guarantees of your rights as a worker, no more minimum guarantees of your basic public health standards, no more minimum guarantees of your environmental protection or environmental quality of life, no more minimum guarantees of your rights as a consumer against large American multinationals. Brexit is the single biggest disenfranchisement of a group of citizens from their own rights and protections as citizens in the modern history of the world. And there's no other way to put it. Brexit is basically a group of people saying, we no longer want to be protected and even the most fundamental ways that our life is protected by the state. Third main point, we have to remember always that the Brexiteers have two main objectives in this process. First of all, they want to undermine public confidence in democracy and the institutions of the state. Everything that they do is explained by one thing and one thing only. They want to convince people that you can't trust politicians, that you can't trust experts, you can't trust the BBC, you can't trust the courts. There is not a single institution in this country which has not been savaged and undermined by the Leave campaign. And their goal is to create such a sense of cynicism and alienation that the population no longer believes in democracy. The second thing they want is absolute chaos. They want chaos. They want disruption. They want damage. Because it's when chaos reigns, the right-wing radicals can transform their little steps towards authoritarian liberalism into big steps towards authoritarian liberalism. 
and none of us should kid ourselves, the real agenda behind Brexit isn't just leaving the EU, the real agenda behind Brexit is a radical, right-wing transformation of this country along lines that I suspect most of the people in this room and in the country would be actually horrified by. So, Irish border problem, a disaster, but Brexit as a whole, a total disaster for all of us. I'm going to take some questions uh, in a minute, friend. But uh, first, I, I do enjoy watching this on YouTube. Uh, three blokes in a pub. Unfortunately, we've ended up with Graham Hughes. <laughs> 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 No, and do stand up so everyone can have a look at you in your nice t-shirt. Hey. Hey. Wow, when we started the Free Blokes of the Book podcast three months ago, we had no idea just how epic it was going to be. We just have to thank anyone here who contributed to the crowdfunder, which allowed us to go all around Britain, also to Geneva, to Gibraltar, to Brussels, to... to uh, uh, Belfast and to Dublin. We learned so much. So yeah, I just want to say something about your class bidding system. One question. Would anyone take Jacob Rees-Mogg seriously if he had a bummy accent? <laughs> Absolutely not. The thing is, when we started the podcast, we had this idea that we wanted to get people to listen to people who knew what they were talking about. But it became quite clear after about three episodes that we had kind of run out of things that we knew about ourselves. So it was important for us to get out there and start asking the experts. So we got out of our area, we, went, we left home, and we went and spoke to people. We spoke to people in Geneva. And what they told us was effectively no matter how bad you think Brexit is going to be, it's going to be even worse. And I'll tell you this, when we came out of the organisation that we spoke to in Geneva, that we can't say what the name of the organisation is, but you can probably work it out. <laughs> <laughs> Jason had tears in his eyes. And he said, I knew it was bad, but I didn't know it was going to be this bad. So what they told us was just absolutely nothing short of apocalyptic for this country. And they told us this like, like we should already know and it should already be in the public discourse. They said, everyone's going to sue you. And we said, what? You know, every company that has invested one pound in your country in the last 40 years because you're part of Europe is going to want their money back. But investing in you because you are part of Europe and that being an entryway to the whole of Europe. Do you think Nissan and Sunderland want to pay 10% on parts coming in and then a 10% tariff on the cars going out? You think their customers are going to pay an extra 20%? Nissan are going to go to the Japanese government and say, Oi, we had an agreement and the British reneged on that agreement and we want our money back. Even if we won every case, the cost of the lawyers, the court time, and they can sue us in four different courts that I know of. There might be more. Our own courts, the WTO, the World Bank, and if it gets to this level, also The Hague. I'll talk about this because of the Good Friday agreement. We went over to Belfast and we actually spoke to someone, one of the guys who helped write the Good Friday Agreement. What he told us was this. There was no concept at the time that we would never be put, that we would pull out of the EU. The Good Friday Agreement was written because Ireland and the UK joined the EU as it was in the EEC. In 1973, we joined on the same day. We joined together and we always backed each other up in, in Europe. We always did. And it was just taken for granted that would re we would remain in the EU. And I have to stress how important the Good Friday Agreement is. It's the most important treaty that Britain has signed since the end of World War II. Thousands of people died in the Troubles. Thousands. And the Good Friday Agreement signaled an end to all that. And here's the next problem they brought up in Geneva. 
They said, who's going to trust you again? You're reneging on 759 international treaties. You're just walking out the room. You've got these agreements and you're saying, well, I don't want to be part of this anymore. Do you think that's not going to come back and bite you? Last week we saw in Bloomsburg, they were reporting on these things called the government, uh, sorry, this thing called the government procurement agreement. No one's ever heard of this. I don't think Theresa May's even heard of this. The government procurement agreement is an agreement between 46 countries in the world to allow our companies to put out a bid on tenders for American infrastructure work paid for by the American government, paid for by the American taxpayer. They can't give American companies preferential treatments over British companies, or Australian companies, or French companies, or any of the 46 signatories of that agreement. We're out. We're leaving the EU. We're only part of that agreement because we're part of the EU. To get back in, we don't need 52%. We need 100%. We need every single one of those 46 countries to say yes. And one of them has already said no. Do you know what that country is? US. Anyone? Moldova! <laughs> Why? Why is little Moldova sandwiched between Ukraine and Romania? Why has Moldova said no? Yes, we refused, we refused a government minister a visa to come visit the country last year to find out more about what's going to happen in the post Brexit thing. Great. Take back control, they said. Take back control. And it gets worse. The agri-food industry in the United Kingdom, the guys in Geneva said it had between 18 months and two years of life left in it. And if you think about it, just logically, like don't forget about the propaganda, forget about what who said and they said and they said. Just think about this for a moment. What's going to happen when the farmers don't have the subsidies? that we get from the EU. Serbia farmers are lucky to make a few grand a year profit, okay? They need those subsidies to keep growing their food that they grow. Yes, the EU is a protectionist club. They're protecting us. <laughs> Every nation in the world tries to protect its own. They do, and then these large group entities of, of trade entities like the, the West African Ecowas, like CAVICOM in the Caribbean, like NAFTA in uh, North America between Mexico, the US and Canada. They all try and protect themselves to some degree. And this is why we protect our farmers because newsflash, it's cheaper to make stuff in America. It's cheaper to build stuff in China. If you don't know this, you don't know the first thing about trade. But we are on the doorstep at the moment of 27 of the countries that the IMF say are advanced economies. There's only 35 in the world. In the entire world, there's only 35. And 27 of them are in Europe. That leaves eight. The rest of the world, 150 odd countries, the rest of the world, there's eight of them advanced economies. And the EU has comprehensive trade deals with four of them that we're part of. At the moment, we have comprehensive trade deals with the EU and those four countries. And we also have association agreements and trade deals to do with commodities that aren't comprehensive, but we do have deals with over a third of the wealth of the world. Because let's not, be, let's not kid ourselves here, right? You've got the wealth of the world is a quarter America, it's a quarter the EU, it's a quarter China and Japan and India. The rest of the world is in that final quarter. And the idea that we're going to get these great new trade deals with these countries, the rest of the world that Jacob B. Small keeps lying to people about because he doesn't know the rest of the world, he's never been there, he's never seen it, he doesn't know what he's talking about. The rest of the world? Even if we could get a trade deal with them that was better than what we've got now, it wouldn't replace what we've got now. We won't get as good a trade deal with the EU, and we can't legally get a good trade, a good as trade deal with Canada, South Korea, Japan, or Singapore. 
because as part of their free trade deal with the EU, they say they can't give a better deal to anybody else. We are the first country in human history to put trade sanctions on itself. <laughs> Seriously, are we mental? This is the things that they say, oh, we're going to put trade sanctions on Iran, they'll be naughty, uh, Russia's but it's done, it invaded this other country, and the next day we're going to put trade sanctions on them. What are trade sanctions? When they try and sell things, it costs more for the countries buying off them. That's what we're doing. 10% on cars is 40% on land. It's not stuck on farmers. 40% tariff, WTO, on land. When we said at the government, at the, at the organization we saw in Geneva, I can't say the name of, they said, you are basically resetting to zero. I mean, you are, you are going from this point where you've negotiated over 40 years and longer to get these tariffs down as low as you possibly can so you can sell your stuff to loads of countries that have got loads of wealth. And I said, well, you know, but Jacob Reese Mark says you can get these great trade deals. And they looked at me like I was a, an idiot. <laughs> he said, listen, you put the GDP of every country in Africa together, it is half. There's 54 countries in Africa. So let's stress this point. I can't stress this point enough. 54 countries in Africa. This is all, in a year, all the diamonds sold from Botswana, all the gold from South Africa, all of the oil from Angola, and the only other 51 countries put together, their entire output, is about half that of France's. Half. But we'll build without the Commonwealth. The sun never set on the British Empire. We'll have Empire 2.0. The Commonwealth is amazingly poor. I think people will be quite disturbed at the fact that we're the richest country in the Commonwealth, India is the second richest country, and they have a population of over a billion. That tells you a lot. The next countries, Canada, Australia, Australia's got a population of 23 million people. It's a small country. People talk about New Zealand, I'm gonna get a new trade deal with New Zealand. New Zealand has a population of 4.7 million, it's half that of London alone. But you take those 48 remaining countries, after you've taken Britain, India, Canada, and Australia out of the equation, 48 of the countries of the Commonwealth, and it includes quite rich countries like Singapore and like Malaysia, it is less than the GDP of Germany, just that one country. We need to understand that we are on the doorstep of our customers. Because in this country, we only produce stuff for wealthy people, for affluent people, for people who have a bit of money to spend on the stuff that we make. We don't make cheap food. We don't make cheap clothing. We don't make cheap mobile phones. These are the things that people want in developing nations. We do not make them. And even if we did, we would price them out just because the manufacturing costs would be so high in this country. We would price it out because the transportation would be so much in this country. So here we are in this situation where Jason and I on the Free Blokes podcast are going around talking to these experts and every week we just get more and more depressed. This week we talked to someone from one of the major, um, oh God, I, one of the things is we, we do interviews with people and they're not allowed to say who they are, what they, who they work for, but uh, they work for a major pharmaceutical company. And they're very high up in this particular company. And they said, until this summer, the British government was seriously considering having our own regulations for medicine. Because we were going to stand on our own two feet. We don't need regulations from some other country to tell us what's safe and not. So we were going to retest all the drugs coming into the country. You imagine all the standstill that we're going to have in Bre after Brexit Day next year if it goes ahead. All those lobbies parked all the way back through Kent all the way back to the M25. You're going to have the same on the other side of the border. On the other side of the, of the channel in, in, in France. You're going to have that in Belgium. You're going to have that in in Holland, although they are a bit, bit, bit better prepared than us. 
there's going to be disruption to the medicines coming in anyway. And they wanted to test them. Testing medicines is really, really difficult. It's an ongoing thing. You don't just test it once and go, hey, it works. Let's just keep making it. You have to test every batch to make sure it's not going to kill someone. If we did that ourselves, it would mean that children who are sick in this country would not get their medicine next April. And the government said to the European Union, this is what we're going to do. And the European looked at them like they were absolute psychopathic lunatics. Because only a psychopath would say something like that. Oh, you know, we're going to hold our sick kids hostage and you have to do what we say. Or, or... So when those first tranche of government preparedness notices came out over the summer, there was a huge sigh of relief in the pharmaceutical industry, in the NHS, doctors, nurses, everything, when the government said they weren't going to have their own regulations. But the fact they thought about it is terrifying. And here's something else. The person that we spoke to, they said, my daughter is, is, is sick, and I've bought myself a freezer so I can keep medicine in there after we pull out. And my dad's got dementia. He takes about seven or eight pills a day. He doesn't know he's taking them, but we have to make him take them. He's also got heart problems. The government's own literature says that we should stockpile medicines. We can't. He's on a repeat prescription. He gets what he needs each month. How do we stockpile it? It just doesn't work in a system where you have an NHS. Maybe you all have private healthcare. Maybe that's the plan. The way it was described to us in Geneva is that the British government is doing the most complex thing ever attempted in the history of the world. And they are doing it at the worst possible time. As, as Andrew as, uh, mentioned, we've got the far right movements coming up all over Europe. We've got Putin on one side who wants the destabilization of the Western world. We've got Trump on the other who wants the destabilization of the Western world. Europe is in the middle. We need to work together because if we don't, the instability of a first world country like Great Britain, the fifth biggest economy in the world, failing will cause war. And we can't, we can't mess about with this. You look at Somalia, that's one failed state in the whole of Africa, and the trouble that that caused to world shipping. Everything you buy costs more now. I think you don't realize it, but it does. Because all the ships coming from China, coming from India, coming from Singapore, coming from Australia, have to go through the pilot. So they have to pay extra insurance, they have to pay extra for security on board those ships. And those costs are passed on to you, the consumer. That's one state. That's what happens when it fails. You get pirates. There's no, there's no navy. There's no coast guard to stop them. Britain, as a failed state on the edge of Europe, will drag the rest of Europe down with us. They're like a, a suicide bomber to our home, to Europe, the country, the, the, the continent of 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 all of us, pretty much, who are here tonight. The continent of Shakespeare. Even all the Shakespeare plays. They're not all set in Little England. Okay, so I feel like I've depressed you enough now. I'm going to just give you some hope because I want to give you some homework to do because I know you know Brexit's awful. And I know I'm, 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 in some ways I'm preaching to the choir, but I just want you to know how, how quite how awful it really is. Um, Jason and I are working on... Um, a few campaigns. We've got one which is called the Are You Sure campaign, which is targeting soft leavers on Facebook. Uh, it's going to be uh, these short adverts where it just says a, a particular thing about the NHS or jobs or whatever, and then it says Brexit. Is your job safe? Are you sure? Is the will the NHS survive? Are you sure? The idea being, we're not, we're not from, you know, people over the head with facts, we're not telling them that they, they must think the EU is amazing, but just to feed into that little thing in people's heads that go, is this, is this really the, the, the right idea? The second thing we're doing is a LinkedIn campaign to small and medium enterprises, because it was something that was taken away from our meetings in Geneva and Brussels and Gibraltar. Oh, I didn't tell you, our meeting in Gibraltar, we were invited over there by the government of Gibraltar, and they said to us, we don't know what we're going to do with our rubbish. And I said, what? They went, rubbish. We, we used to have an incinerator when the border was closed in the 80s, but we got rid of that years ago. We don't have the space, we don't have any landfill. 
and we don't have a container, uh, we don't have a port that we can get rid of trash on. It all goes out to Spain at the moment. And I'm like, so what are you going to do with it? And they go, we have no idea. But then the British government has no idea about any of this stuff because it's so complex and no one had the opportunity to step back. I mean, there were a few experts who, who knew a lot about a particular facets of this whole thing. But there's no one who stepped back and went, oh my God, this is so complex. This is ridiculous. And one of the things they said in, um, in, our, in our meetings, I think it was in Brussels, they said you need to get small and medium enterprises to raise their voices. Next time you go in, I went to uh, my girlfriend's death and, and we went to the audiologist uh, last week and she asked the audiologist where the batteries are gonna come from after March next year. Because she goes through batteries like, you know, every day in her, in her hearing aids. And uh, the audiologist said, oh, well, you know, we, we get them from the usual supplier. I said, yeah, but where does it come from? Have you read the government's preparedness notices? <laughs> no. I'm looking at going, this is your business. How can you not know if you're going to still be able to get the stuff that you need to continue trading? But we've got this attitude in the UK. And this comes to the, uh, the third campaign that Jason and I are doing, um, which is called the um, We Need to Talk About Brexit campaign. Because, God, it's embarrassing, isn't it? Oh, it's like telling someone that you're gay or that you're, you're I don't know. It, you know, that you're not a Christian anymore or something. It's just, it's just one of those things. It's, it's, it takes a lot of courage to just come out and say, listen, slightly racist uncle who voted leave. <laughs> I think you're wrong and this is why. We're British and we don't like doing that. We don't like making a scene. But we're running out of time, guys. We've got to talk about Brexit and not just amongst ourselves. So please, do the stuff you're doing. What you're doing at the moment is great. You are part of a movement. I'm sure a lot of you went on the march in London a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Thank you. You are supporting the people's vote, which is the, the way out of this. That is the government's get out of jail free card. It's our get out of jail free card. Uh, but also, please, please, please write to your MPs every day. Write to your MPs. Just annoy them as much as humanly possible. Because they're like the rest of us anything for a quiet life but most of all please talk to your friends your family your colleagues who voted to leave and please tell them some of the stuff that you've learned over the last two years because i didn't know any of this stuff two years ago but apparently i have enough um acumen and knowledge about this situation to make a decision <coughs> on it which is what we did i didn't know I was, i've got a degree in politics i was like I don't know if we should stay in the EU or not. I've never really looked into it. When you go on the, um, you know, when you sign up to Tinder, it gives a, a, a whole list of terms and conditions. I didn't get that when I voted. If you do that in Ireland, by the way, where they have referenda quite a lot, they give you, they give out everyone who's going to vote all the information about it. We never got that. We just got propaganda. So we need to combat that propaganda. And um, I'm going to sit down and I've talked, I've talked far too much. I don't know what time I'm going in. Um, when you talk to leaders, you don't necessarily have to fat them until they fart, okay? <laughs> A better way of doing it is just imagine in your head that they've fallen in love with a wrongdom, okay? <laughs> So don't necessarily go in and go, hey, the EU's great, because that's a bit like going, why didn't you dump your girlfriend and go up this girl instead, who they would then find attractive. No, so just sit them down and quietly and calmly, as you would if you wanted to tell your friends that, you know, their partner probably wasn't the best choice. Be very diplomatic, very loving, and understand that the Brexit vote was a crime of passion. It was an emotional response to a situation. There was no logic in it. And if you try and hammer them with facts, it just won't work. Just tell them your concerns. Tell them that you want to just not be worried, not be kept up at night sick with worry about what's gonna happen next year. Because we don't know. The government don't know. The EU don't know. Nobody knows where this country is going to be in April. Is this real? Is this real life? Is this actually happening? 
I think if a lot of us didn't know if our job was secure the next April, we'd be a bit concerned. I think if a lot of us knew if our relationship wasn't secure next April, we'd be a bit concerned. This goes above and beyond all of that. And when you look at how many people's lives are absolutely critically entwined with us being a member of the European Union, one way or the other, whether it's trade, commodities, medicine, just, you know, this is not about going on holiday. It's about more than that. It's about who we are as people. So please, make your voices heard. Don't leave here and just go, oh, that was great, you know, that was fun listening to Ray and Michael and Terry and, and, and Andrew and, and, uh, and Matt speak. You can change things yourself, but just keep fighting because no one has ever had to fight anything like this before, especially not in this country. And we don't know what is going to work, so we just have to keep fighting. But I'll tell you what won't work, and that's doing nothing. Thank you. But that's the reality of uh, Brexit, is everybody thinks, but well, it can't be that bad, can it? And you're going, mate, you've got no idea. I had no idea until I read up on the stuff, and you're thinking, can it be that awful? But everything coming back says that it is. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those weird British things, when they go about, it's all the Brit spirit. And that drives me crazy too. I remember, you know, when it, when it was the Queen's Jubilee a couple of years ago, and uh, the BBC interviewed a guy watching the flotilla go past on the Thames, and he had an umbrella in the rain. And they said, oh, you're standing here in the rain with an umbrella. What's that all about? He said, well, it's a blitz spirit. And I thought, an umbrella in the rain? As opposed to the Germans bombing your houses? I think you've mixed the, Brit the blitz spirit up a bit. And there is this kind of, we're all sleepwalking to something that we don't understand. And that's the reality, and that's what's hard to wake people up about. So, any, any questions for our experts? gets back from Brussels next week or whenever these little talks end is no deal or no Brexit. And, and by the way, don't think that if you have another referendum it's going to be a knife edge thing again. I know a lot of people haven't changed their minds, but we got 48% of the, of the voting population voters to vote remain with the worst campaign in British <laughs> political history, with David Cameron as leader of it. And we still got 48%. With your help and your support and all the different groups, the Remain groups all around the United Kingdom, if we get the people's vote, this time we will smash it out of the ballpark. I'll wait for Terry. I'm going to take a question from Mike if possible. Um, I spend a lot of time out arguing with people while discussing with people, particularly about the Irish border. Thank you. Um, what I struggle with is the argument that, you know, we understand Customs Union required the border. The argument that I get back, that I struggle to answer, is that, well, they have different tax rates. They have different VAT rates, they have different uh, fuel duty levies. How is that border police? At the moment, how can I give a solid answer back to that question? 
Okay, so there's a really simple answer, and of course this is part of the this is part of the the, the, the deliberate leave propaganda to try and belittle the Irish border question and make it feel like it's just been deliberately manufactured by the EU as a way of punishing for Little Britain. The easy answer is very, very common sense actually. You say, okay, every country in the world has different VAT rates, different fuel rates, different different income taxes, different regimes, yet they all have customs borders. Every country in the world has a customs border. You'd have thought that if it was as easy as just saying we have different income tax, we can live with that, the borders wouldn't be a problem anywhere in the world. There isn't a single pair of territories anywhere on planet Earth that have managed to solve the problem of having different regulatory standards and tariff regimes and not having an enforceable border. And we are not going to discover the secret of alchemy <laughs> in the next two weeks, which will suddenly make these problems disappear. So the answer is a really common sense answer. If that were true, why does the world have borders? And the world clearly has borders, so it cannot be true. And it's a little bit like when people say to you, you know, the world, the world, not that I'm suggesting that people say this on a regular basis, but this is the type of argument it is. The moon is made of candy floss. And you say, well, the moon isn't made of candy floss. And they say, prove it to me. <laughs> and you say, well, well, I can't prove it myself, but we all know it's not made of candy floss. We know that. And yet they still think the onus is on you to prove that the moon is not made of candy floss. Sorry, if everyone on planet Earth that has different customs and regulations has a customs border, the moon is not made of candy floss. And I think that's the way you deal with that question. Thank you. Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, there's one thing about the Irish, um, what the DUP wants, which is that they're saying, oh, we don't want to have different regulations to the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, hello? You don't have abortion. You don't have gay marriage. You have a different tax rate. You have your own assembly, not that you use it. But you already are treated as a special region. And you know what? If we do pull out of the EU, if we don't get given a people's vote, if this horrible thing does happen, the best thing for Northern Ireland would be to have one foot in the EU and the other foot in the UK. What the DUP are demanding is that they give up that special status that they could have, that would actually work really well in Northern Ireland's favour. Wouldn't work well in our favour, but you know, Northern Ireland, they'll be, they'll be laughing. We're still part of the single market, still part of the customs union. And at the moment, there are checks on goods coming across from the island of Ireland to the island of Great Britain because if it's anything agricultural, we have to check foot and mouth, we have to check for BSE and other diseases like that. So there are checks at the moment in the North Sea. So that's another line that they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I love from the DUP. Are they doing witch burning again? <laughs> or is that gone? I think uh, they're busy worried about the dinosaurs, but. Okay, yeah, but that's wrong for that. At the back. Thank you. Um, yes, Penny Rogers from IP. I was picking up on uh, Graham's point about potential shortage of vital medicines and pharmaceutical products uh, if the Brexit. And I just wanted to let people know that this is actually happening now. I uh, heard this afternoon from two people yeah. who have had problems for the first time ever getting hold of their normal insulin supplies, one for themselves and one for a member of their family. This has never happened before. Uh, they've had one person has a contact with the pharmaceutical industry who won't go public, won't be named, but is saying that they are already being told the pharmaceutical industry are diverting supplies of vital things like insulin in order to start building up those stockpiles. So that's not, that's not going to be happening in March, you know, now. At the moment, nobody wants to go public on this, it's all rumour, but I just wanted to ask if there's anybody knows, if any of you have problems or family have problems, getting hold of essential drugs now. Um, and if anybody has contacts in the pharmaceutical industry who might be interested or willing to talk to the press, then we're going to try and run a story on this. So could you talk to me, Penny Roberts from IP, or Kath Moss, who got to the looking on the So anybody having problems getting hold of their drugs, you know, yeah. pharmaceuticals, yeah. you know, insulin, 
Or has contacts within France which can... Or contacts where they know that there's going to be shortages because of the stock Okay, thanks very much. Excuse me, can I just... Um, uh, just check though, because there is actually a worldwide shortage of insulin at yeah, the moment. We need to be more yeah. rigorous. Uh, yeah, there. Yeah, if, if, if you're not too shy, come up and then say it on the microphone. Hi, I'm uh, Raul Cairnescu, and my question would be kind of both for the panelists and for uh, Manchester for Europe as an organization. If, fingers crossed, we do get the people, people's vote, I think that it's pretty good that it will be us, the people in this room, who will be delivering the referendum campaign on the ground and will try to find ways to win this uh, new referendum. So my question for everybody would be, how do we do things differently than last time? How do you think, I, no, we as individuals who are going to be campaigning on the ground, what do you think we should be doing differently? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we need to put some positives. positives to the EU. We need to not have David Cameron as our figurehead. We need to make sure that we Explain to people, because one of the things that's annoyed me, especially about um, the Labour MPs, is that they've chosen to placate the racists in their community because they don't want to educate them. And I think that education is a massive part of this in terms of, I'm talking about school here, just making people understand how important the EU is to them. And that, you know what, the EU is not perfect and we need to be honest about that. It's got some certain aspects about it that we could really do with improvement. But the only way we're going to do that is if we're part of the EU. We're not going to do it from outside. And so I think a bit of humility, I think a bit of um, you know positivity about the whole thing. And I also think that the, the, the grassroots groups like Manchester for York, Liverpool for York, Leeds for York and all the different groups around the country Working together is going to be massive and have a huge, huge impact. And I can see that if we all do work together, the people's vote could be, and I'm, I'm serious here, a remain vote of two thirds. And that would be stonking because that is what remain got in 1975 when we had the first referendum on whether we should be in Europe or not. So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to Durham, so I've got to go to the 10 o'clock train. Lovely cathedral, by the way. Yes. yes. <laughs> Apparently it's 20 minutes for walk, and it's 18 minutes too now, so I'm going to like it. I'm going to give uh, Tanya a copy of the book here. But thank you all for coming. Yeah. Hopefully I'll see you around. We're all doing this in the circle, so um, we're going to ask another question. But, um, Mike's staying here for a bit so he can answer some more, some more technical questions because he really does know his stuff. And I, I'm just repeating what other people have told me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. One of the finest examples of the Anglo-Roman architecture in a country, Durham Cathedral, and actually made it. I think it was one of the only buildings in Britain that actually made that. Uh, oh, fantastic! How is it? I bet you went through four, four packs of cranes, right? <laughs> Right, that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Graham. Round of applause. I was going to say, there is going to be some food arriving, but if anyone wants pizzas, they want an idea of who wants them, so can you stick your hand up now? Oh, they're on their way. Oh, you're on the way anyway. Oh, shit. You just guessed. I bet you want to know six people sugaring the tea without asking them. <laughs> right, so again, we've got Graham here who's uh, the expert, so I get questions. Graham, just a question. I'm a European citizen. All of you are, and many of you, put your names down on the two European petitions, one of which is still running, to retain your European citizenship. The rest of you, why not? Because get we're on get it done. Right. Let me find it. Okay, Michael, if, if you can help with this, please do. Okay, um, Oh, I'm a bit moot now, aren't I? Um, listen, there's a difference between... This is a very good example, actually, of the difference between the, the legal situation and the political situation. The legal situation is getting clearer. 
if you're not a national of a member state, you're not an EU citizen. And there's no exceptions, there's no way to keep it, there's nothing you can do about it. Legally speaking, if you're not a national of a member state, you're not an EU citizen. However, politically, if there's a, enough people who are saying we are outraged, we are disappointed, we are scandalized, we are horrified, we want to retain our European citizenship, it's a very useful way of reminding the EU institutions and the other member states that Theresa May does not speak for the whole of the UK. Now this is one of the things that, that, that you learn when you're doing e e EU work, is that that the member states and the EU institutions rely very heavily on the official contact points to know how a country is thinking. They're not reading the papers like we are, they're not attending meetings like this, they're relying on the official government spokespeople for what the view of the country is. Anything which you can do to bypass the official view of Theresa May and actually voice your feelings and your thoughts directly to the EU institutions or directly to the other member states has an inherent value. Even if it can't necessarily lead to a particular legal outcome, it has a really important value. And the second reason it's uh, important and valuable is that the European Parliament, to its credit, is actually very supportive of the idea of having some sort of system whereby if the UK does leave, and of course we all hope that it doesn't happen, but if the UK does leave, that they introduce some sort of regime to give a sort of associate citizenship to UK citizens who want to opt into it. Again, the more that the European Parliament senses that there's a grand swell of public opinion that would support that option, the more valuable it is. So, legally speaking, maybe not the best news in the world, but politically, that's the important. Just one comeback on that. Do you know how else you can lose your EU citizenship? By being a mass murderer, or horrendous criminal, a huge tax fraudster, etc. That is the only other way. Are you all criminals? No. Get online, get it done! I was going to say the sneaky one for me and Michael is because my parents are both Irish and again Northern Ireland, we can get our EU citizenship anyway. But I'm going to have uh, one, more, one more question. One more question, a second from the back. Yeah, right, you. yeah you, go on. Sorry mate, you look too eager. <laughs> you also like the stalker you want. <laughs> So my question is to Michael, um, is there a danger, if there is any withdrawal agreement, there will be an attempt to smuggle us into a blind Brexit. So those you don't, we won't have a vote, to, you know, we won't be able to vote on anything substantive at all. So, so Theresa May's strategy is pretty clear. It's, it's Brexit at any cost. Huh? This is her strategy. It's been her strategy for quite a long time. It's just delivering Brexit. Um, she doesn't particularly care what comes after. She doesn't particularly care what the consequences are. It's delivering Brexit. Um, and there's a couple of dangers that, that are associated with any of the particular outcomes that Theresa May might bring back. First of all, let's remind ourselves what Theresa May promised. She promised that already by this date, and not just Theresa May, but her government as a whole, she promised that we'd have not just the withdrawal agreement with the EU, but we'd have completely finalized our entire future relationship with Europe. And not just in trade, but in security, defense, science, the environment, all the rest of it. What is, what, what is the best that she's actually gonna get? She's gonna get a 10 page heads of terms, which outlines what the possible principles are for the future negotiations about the relationship between the EU and the UK. By her very own standards, she is a complete and utter failure, total failure. Let's remind ourselves as well, and this links up to what Graham said before. Uh, Liam Fox stood up in Parliament in September 2016 and said he was absolutely confident, absolutely confident, that within 12 to 14 months, i.e. the September just passed, he would have completed a full round of global trade negotiations between Britain and the rest of the world. What's his current tally? Zero. Zero. So these people are going to try and pretend that whatever pathetic little deal they bring back is a triumph. And that's their tactic. But there's another thing we've really got to bear in mind here. The, the most important part of Theresa May's deal, such as it is, is the transition period. Yeah? So the idea is that we leave in March 2019, 
but nobody notices any particular change for about two years because everything pretty much stays the same for that period of time. We lose all our voting rights, we lose all our influence, and no longer have any seat at the table. We become a complete rule taker, but nothing much changes for about two years. So the actual concrete consequences of Brexit only emerge when it's too late for anybody to do anything about it. And this is an entirely deliberate strategy. There were lots of different ways that Britain could have agreed a transitional period that wouldn't have acted like this. They were much more legally straightforward, much more politically straightforward. Theresa May's government deliberately designed a withdrawal deal that would deliver Brexit at any cost and the full consequences will not become clear for about two years afterwards. And by that stage, who are they going to blame? Everyone in the world, apart from the bloody selves, who caused the mess in the first place. This is a deliberate attempt to escape accountability and transparency from the Brexit Brigade who have actually caused this entire mess. And I think that's a really important thing that we've got to bear in mind and an important message to get across. They are deliberately trying to trick the British people into thinking that Brexit isn't such a big deal and then suddenly when the shit hits the fan, it's somebody else's fault, not theirs. Uh, so I'm going to leave my last question, but we don't really have any uh, time for that now. Uh, I've got to say uh, thank you very much to, to Professor Michael Dugan. There is that feeling that the world's kicking the can down the road on Brexit, but it's getting uncomfortably close. Thank you very much for listening to me. Before I get off, let me please uh, introduce to you the un incoming chair of, uh, the, of uh, Manchester for Europe, uh, Kath uh, Moss. Well, the one with the last standing <laughs> panel. Um, Michael, will you be hanging around? Because I know loads of people still want to ask questions. So. I, 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 I still very really come to Manchester that I've got no idea what time the last train's at, but I'm going to get to the last train whatever time it's at. Um, so I'll be hanging around until then. Okay, so I'm sure if you buy Michael a drink and ask him a question, I'm sure he'll be very happy to answer before he catches his last train. And a big thanks also to Terry. And we'd love to see far more of you with us on our street schools, Terry. Ask me. Tomorrow, Ferry. Uh, tomorrow. St. Anne's Square. Okay, we'll keep in touch. We really need you to help us turn this around. So I hope everybody here feels inspired to take, take the fight that we are going to win in the next few weeks. Um, a few points just read tonight. Uh, we have ordered some pizza because I'm starving yeah. and I'm, I, I'm yeah. thinking that so the pizza's here. Please do, please do tuck in if you can sort of put in a voluntary, I don't know, two quid a piece or something like that just to cover the cost. That would be great. Um, picking up, I think, on Andrea Davis's point, um, if you've not done your postcards to Theresa May and your MP yet, then take a third and take one, if you have done them, and send one to Jeremy Corbyn. I think we owe that to Andrew Adonis that Jeremy Corbyn gets 200 postcards from us to know. Um, we've also got um, some merchandise at the back. Please do have a look at it, you know, and if there's anything there, you know, um, t-shirts or whatever. Um, then please, you know, get involved you know, by, by whatever you can. Um, we've also got a raffle. If you've not got your raffle uh, tickets, please do buy some. They are to cover the costs of the band and of the evening. Um, we will, well, we've not been very good at timekeeping, so if I say half past 10, I'll probably be 11, but we will we'll do the raffle by 11 o'clock tonight, For because you know, obviously I know some of you want to go. Um, I'm hoping that loads of you don't, I'm hoping that those of you will stay around. We've got an evening of music now ahead of us with Rock for Europe. We will have to move some of the chairs away, so it would be great if you can help. Um, but otherwise, we're going to take a little break now. I think Fellow Bojo is going to come and entertain while we sort of sort the room out. Um, our very own Boris Johnson. So please hang around, have some pizza, and let's have a really good rest of night and, and be inspired. Let's see everybody here on the street souls moving forward. Thank you. Yeah.